tackling a really important issue, which is about mental health and wellness in a space, while also going through your own struggles, uh, as well as uh, having fought off uh, leukemia and now being immunocompromised in the middle of a pandemic and still wanting to set up a startup. Uh, I think that's going to boggle a lot of people's minds. Uh, so for those who don't know you yet, could you introduce yourself? Yeah, definitely. Um, thanks for, for having me on and uh, for that, that introduction as well. Uh, you make me sound, I think, like a, a lot more put together than I feel um, very often. But yeah, thanks for having me here. So to everyone, hi, my name is Melissa Ung. I am the CEO of Bravely. We're a mental health startup that supercharges therapy. So my journey with mental health started way before I ever went into tech. Um, mental health was just something that I really struggled with, feelings of anxiety, depression, um, and, and a lot of things kind of a bit, bit more worse than, than that. Um, it was a really sharp contrast to the life that I had for what people could sort of see um, on the outside. So when I graduated, I started my own product design agency. Um, it was fully remote from day one, long before the pandemic. Um, and we ended up being able to work with a lot of amazing clients, startups from around the world, clients like McDonald's, Samsung, and Visa. And because everything was fully remote, I was able to travel as well. And I ended up traveling um, around about 40 countries while I was running the business. So from the outside, it just seemed like great. You know, I kind of achieved all the goals that I wanted to have. But on the inside, it was a completely different story. I, I felt like most days I was barely holding it together. Um, I tried everything that was available to me, you know, going to therapy, trying to like read up, trying to do all these different things, but it was still a, a huge struggle. And one day I just realized, you know, after having designed thousands of products for all these companies, there hadn't been a single one that had anything to do with mental health. I touched every industry, just not mental health. <laughs> so it seemed like it was it was due time. This was back in 2019, um, you know, back when when you thought about a mental health app, you had Headspace, which is a wonderful app, but it focuses on mindfulness and meditation. And mental health is, is a huge, huge field with so much more in that. So the idea really was to design an experience where people could go to, um, you know, I don't want to sound like a cliche, but basically a safe space. But a safe space doesn't mean sort of a, a wet blanket space. You know, it doesn't mean wrap you up in, in cotton and just kind of leave you there. Um, for me, a safe space was really things that, A, don't make me feel worse. B, uh, have scientifically proven methods to actually help me de-escalate how I was feeling. And, and the last bit was to teach me more about general mental health, things that will add to my overall literacy. So we started that. Uh, and then, of course, you know, Jeremy, like you've said, life likes to throw curveballs. Um, I was diagnosed with leukemia two months after starting the company, which was, um, I think, quite obviously very, very devastating and, and really quite terrifying. During that time, it really showed just how little support there was in terms of mental health. There was so much focus on my physical health and absolutely that, that made sense. But when it came to the emotional struggle, the psychological battle, I was left pretty much entirely on my own. Um, so we kept bravely going through the chemo rounds, through the hospital stays. And as I started to get better, really returned back to it full time. Um, and today we've, we've been keeping it going. We've been really focused on trying to design something that is evidence-based, scientific, but incredibly user-friendly. And then now we're also trying to do the same thing to support therapists. So long journey, full of ups and downs. We're still in the middle of a pandemic, but I'm just really glad that I'm here. Wow, that's a lot. And there's so much interesting <laughs> stuff. I mean, the fact that, you know, you were doing remote work before remote work became mandatory or cool or uncool, depending <laughs> on it. Uh, the fact that you built your own design agency, the fact that you chose to be a founder and then, you know, kind of life hitting you. But just before we kind of do all those things, 
So why out of graduating from university, the first thing you said was, I want to be a founder and a founder in a remote work company back in 2018, all right? So that was a long time ago. Uh, that, was a long, that was a long time ago. Um, yeah, so I, I actually didn't even graduate from university. I graduated from uh, Nian Polytechnic. Uh, and of course, you know, everyone wants you to go to university. And I was just really stubborn about it. I just really didn't want to go to university. I didn't want to get a nine to five. And the main reason I didn't want to do that is a really simple, possibly really silly reason. I just didn't want to wake up in the mornings to have to go somewhere. That was that was the, the crux of it. But I think it, it boiled down to something that was a lot deeper, which was I didn't want to um, be living the rest of my life where I was made to show up at a certain time, allowed to leave at a certain time and only had, you know, 14 days out of the year to enjoy. Like I wanted every day to be the sort of day that I wanted to, to live. And this doesn't mean, you know, you just party every day. But I think for me, autonomy and purpose are two values that are like really strong with me. Um, so it wasn't that I wanted to be a, a founder. It was that I didn't want somebody to tell me what to do. So my parents were not very happy about that because, you know, it's a bit of a, a like Singaporean dream. You know, your kids go off to uni, they graduate, they get a nice, stable job, um, good career. And I said no to all of that. Um, which was uh, which was a fight at, at the time, but I think that that risk has sort of paid off. But for me, it was very much that I wanted to live life on my own terms, and that included work because work is at least half of your waking hours. It's such a huge part of your life. You have to find some sort of meaning and purpose in it. You have to want to wake up and actually be like, yeah, I want to show up to work today. And it's interesting because you worked with such great clients like Malawi as McDonald's, Visa and Samsung. Um, so, and it sounds like you had something to do with the beloved delivery service. Could you share more about that? <laughs> yep. Uh, so, you know, for me, I started out as a freelancer and, and I started out just doing like really simple things and just kept trying to improve, kept trying to do better. There was, there was, there was this very strong perfectionist side of me that was just never happy with what I ended up delivering so the next one always had to be better and really what that meant was um, I just had this internal culture within myself and then eventually the team that I brought on where you were just you were just always learning and trying to get better and that resulted in us getting bigger and bigger clients um, and we ended up attracting McDonald's was one of our first big clients that we had um, and part of what we had to do was to help them with the localization of the Mac delivery app. So over the years it spanned into, into a, a pretty huge effort uh, working with them which was incredibly cool. When we started I think they had Mac delivery in only I want to say only Singapore if I remember correctly but by the time we had finished working with them across about four years, possibly more. Uh, we had launched McDonald's in, I believe, over 40 countries across Asia Pacific, Middle East, and Africa. Um, so we, we helped, we like to think that we helped send burgers and fries to people in all those different countries. Um, so it was, it was a very, very rewarding experience just getting to work. Uh, on that sort of scale, launching things in, honestly, countries we didn't even really know much about. Out of quick curiosity, uh, <laughs> when you say localize, what were some interesting things that you learned from localizing uh, Mac delivery, right? A McDonald's delivery to Southeast Asia in different countries? What was it that was key from your learning? Yeah, there are quite a few things. I think the the first rule is that no two markets are ever really the same. So even though they may seem culturally quite similar or they might speak a similar language, there would be small things that would make a difference. So with McDonald's, um, different places had different menu. That was the, the really first thing. But in, in terms of localizing the design itself, you had really 
tiny details that you had to take into consideration, even things like the length of text. So some languages, when you write out the same word, the text is actually a lot longer. And when that text becomes longer, your design actually needs to change a bit more. And if your text ends up taking so much space that it knocks, let's just say, the, the final checkout button below the fold where people have to scroll, then they're going to very easily miss that. And when they miss that, it means that they might bounce. So what is it that you have to change to be able to fit those kinds of things? Um, other bits that were interesting that we, we encountered for the first time were languages that went, instead of reading left to right, it read right to left and so it was just kind of mind-boggling because you kind of had to flip everything around um, and then figure out like okay you know not just flipping the text how is it that people think like to them what does progress look like for us progress goes left to right for them does progress go right to left instead so it was very much about understanding these nuances where they came from and then being able to really distill that into trying to empathize and understand what it's like to be in their shoes like really think about it from their point of view and then apply those little changes um, so that it feels like a very native experience to them and that sounds like a, such a fun ride. I mean, it must have been crazy intense as well. And I think you started sharing a little bit more that during these times also when you started developing, uh, you know, struggles and overcoming kind of like the mental wellness on a personal basis. Could you share more? Because it feels like shouldn't you be on top of the world for building like your own business? You prove yourself right because you didn't go to university, <laughs> you know? So shouldn't you be like, yes, I, I crushed this. You know, so what was that aspect of you? What, what was it that you were dealing with at that time? Uh, if, while you're comfortable sharing, yeah. So I I started struggling with my mental health from when I was ten, which I think confuses a lot of people because you think like, hey, you know, you're just a kid, like you're ten years old. What do you what do you have to to really struggle with? Um, and it, I mean, I think if we look at at today's society, if we look at how things were back when I was 10 years old, um, you had extremely limited amount of support. There was still a lot of stigma. There was a very low awareness about general mental health, um, you know, just gen what are healthy boundaries, what are healthy relationships. And of course, students, uh, I would say around the world, but in Singapore in, in particular, face a lot of pressure to perform. And it was a combination of these things. My family was also going through quite a lot of, of hardship, um, both personal and financial. And it all just really took a toll on me. I remember when I was 10 years old, I discovered the term depression. And I actually went to look it up. You know, you would think like, yeah, 10 years old, you know, back then you should be concerned about, I don't know, Neopets or whatever. But here I was having to dial up internet, looking up symptoms of depression. And I actually printed out this, this two page sheet of paper that was talking about it and the symptoms of it. And I was, as I was looking through it, I realized like, hey, I check every single box that is here. But again, as a kid, like, what can you do if the people around you don't know about mental health struggles, if they don't believe that as a kid, you have, have issues that need to be addressed and worked on, you are left on your own. And that was very much the case for me. I struggled with that, that depression. Um, I had a bit of anxiety, but it didn't, it wasn't as bad uh, back then. It actually got worse as, as I got older. Um, and I found that I was crying myself to sleep like every single night, you know, as a, as a, again, as a 10 year old, just simply not knowing what to do um, and having no resources available to me. And it just continued from there because it, it, it kept snowballing. It, it wasn't like, oh, you know, I'm having a hard time now. And then, oh, I, I grow out of it, you know, life kind of does give you more hardships as you go along, more challenges, stresses. Um, and I found that, you know, I basically gritted my teeth and just tried to make it through. Even as a young adult, I was still having a really hard time. In fact, that it actually got worse. And then with the pressures of being a solo founder, it got even worse. 
And from the outside, uh, like I said, you know, a lot of people were looking at my life and being like, oh, you have all these great things. You're traveling all the time. Like, the, like that's amazing. But the reality of that was that I was a workaholic because I didn't want to address the other things. I wanted that distraction. So that's already unhealthy. I was traveling all the time as an added distraction because I found that if I sat alone and I was quiet, it all just came crashing back down on me. So it looked great from the outside, but the truth was that it was another form of escaping and distracting. These two things ended up giving me even more of, of that profile of being a nomad and a remote worker and you know you work so much at some point this the stuff that you can show for it but they were driven by unhealthy coping mechanisms and at some point it just really came to a head um you know i i remember very clearly having to call up my my Mallory team um and basically admit to them like hey i've been having a really really hard time it's now getting to a point where it's so bad I'm gonna have to step aside and leave the running of the company up to you guys which if you're a workaholic if you're a perfectionist that is not an easy thing to do but I had to do that because I just simply couldn't um, function anymore and it was at a point where I felt like all right you know my life is in danger I I need to something needs to give so I took a step back and when I took a step back for a few months, I was just feeling really quite lost. But in that space, ended up coming up with the idea for, for Bravely and building off on that. Um, and, and then really found purpose in that. I think that that's one of the big differences is realizing through working on this, realizing that this experience that I have, that I thought it was just me and maybe me being weak, Mm, that's not just me that's a lot of people that are out there and if 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 we can be doing something that will stop another 10 year old out there from feeling the same way then yeah i'm gonna do it and what's interesting is that you chose to do all that while being a founder and to some extent you chose to be open about it and to build a product solving that problem. So was that, did it come together at the same time or was that one come before the other? Yeah, I think it kind of came together at the same time. The, the reaction that I got from my team when I, I told them was incredibly supportive and I was really scared. Um, you know, and, and I do feel like I had been sort of, I've been pushing myself to a point where it, I, I almost didn't care what anyone else had to say. It's kind of like, you know, when, when you're in that much pain, it's, it's at some point that, that, that stuff just doesn't really matter. It's, it still does like deep down, but their response was so supportive. It was so understanding. And I, it, it was like this wave of relief because suddenly it was just like, oh, wait a minute, I'm, I'm not actually alone in this thing. And that told me even more about the power of being vulnerable. I think in this society, people tell you or, or society tries to push you and mold you into someone that's, you know, you don't fail, you are perfect, you're switched on all the time, you're strong, you're confident, you are fearless. And for me, I don't really think that um, that is that healthy to, to have. At the end of the day, everyone's human. You know, you have anxieties and fears for a reason. It's biological. Um, and I didn't want to add to that further sort of social media envy where you only post the highlights of your life because I know how much that made me feel like I was failing, even though I was already doing all these things. And I'm like, wait a minute, what am I doing? Like, I'm not talking about me having a hard time when this is most of my days. And I have these occasional highlights and those are the only things that I'm showing. I'm, I'm contributing to this problem. So I just figured, all right, if I can't be honest and I can't be transparent, who am I trying to trick? Like, who am I trying to convince? Is it somebody else? Is it myself? Or is it going to be better if I can own up and say, like, look, I'm having a hard time with this. 
if you're having a hard time too, you're not alone. And I wish that I had that when I was growing up and, and I had that um, in, in my 20s. But if I didn't have that back then, then the next best thing I could do is to, to try and make that happen. What's interesting is that there's a journey of opening and vulnerability, as you shared. Mm -hmm. There's also a journey of recovery. And then there's also a journey of, you know, making this a crusade, right? You know, <laughs> so because those are very three different journeys, right? One is opening up and saying, I have a problem, right? Yeah. And this is because you open up doesn't mean that you're getting better. It just means that now other people are now alert that they can help you. Yeah. Uh, so I, I'm curious about that journey of healing or recovery from your perspective at that point of time. And also I'm, I'm interested in how you also said, you know, at the end of that healing process, you said, well, now I want to crusade against this, right? You know, and, and solve this problem, right? Um, mm. So could you share a little bit more about that, those two transitions? Yeah, sure. Uh, the, the healing was incredibly gradual. Um, it took a really, really long time and I am doing a lot better these days. I mean, it, you know, there are so many things that I'm actually really proud of and it's such a weird uh, feeling to be able to go to your therapist during a therapy session and just be like, instead of talking about all the different things that have been really upsetting and really been struggling with, to be like, I did this thing the other day and I'm actually really proud of how I handled that. That is not something that I thought I would have uh, ever been able to, to, to say. Um, and I credit that in large part to continuously learning about mental health in general. When I started, the struggle was really all the misinformation, um, all the biases that I had around mental health that society had just imparted to me. And it took a really long time to unlearn those things. You know, I think everyone knows it's easy to learn something. It's super hard to unlearn something. And it was unlearning those things and keep continuously just sort of picking at them and trying to sort of chisel them down, practicing the things that have been told to you. Those are the things that were really difficult and took such a long um, amount of time. The things that really moved the needle for me was surrounding myself with people who were not only supportive, but they actually understood. So instead of having people say, uh, you know, well-meaning, but misguided things like, oh, your life's so great. Like, why are you, why are you, you know, so, um, upset about things you know just think positively like that doesn't help anyone but instead now I'm surrounded by people who say like hey you're having a hard time that's totally normal with what you're going through like maybe take it easy on yourself today or if you want to talk I'm absolutely here or even more practical things like hey there's this thing that that um, my therapist told me about or that I read about in a science paper like do you want to try it so instead of it just being sort of what I call uh, cushion cover quotes. There's actual practical science and then also people, uh, a support community that I have surrounding myself. And that was really the biggest thing that helped me um, on this journey to healing. So it wasn't one sort of specific thing. It was a combination of the, in uh, of the different things that made up the environment that I was in. Um, Weirdly enough, you know, when you were describing the phases about how sort of the crusading came at the end, I would say it was almost the other way around, that the crusading came before the, the, the big progress in the healing, I would say. And that was because it was so much easier to, to funnel all these struggles that I had, all the strong feelings that I had into trying to make a difference and in the process of crusading, in the process of not just speaking up for myself, but trying to speak up for other people who might feel similarly to me. That was also when I started to meet the right people, be surrounded by the right resources. And that's when I found, you know, the healing that was gradually happening just suddenly started sort of skyrocketing. And it was because of that change in environment. It was that purpose that I had. Um, and it's been, an incredibly fulfilling 
kind of a journey, which I feel like is a bit of a cliche. Um, but it, it, you know, just because it's a cliche doesn't doesn't make it any any less true. And I have a lot of credit to give to the people that I'm surrounded by. Well, I wouldn't say it's a cliche <laughs> to heal from something. Uh, I would say it's more of an archetype, uh, really, um, because it's a it's one of the end states that we all want, right? Um, yeah. So what's interesting is that you chose to also build, as you said, and channel the energy, which is amazing. And you chose to channel the energy into an app, right? <laughs> you know, uh, which is you know, lots of people also channel you know things they overcome, right, by volunteering or. But this is interesting because you're making this in a company. So talk us more true about how you went about founding, uh, briefly. Yeah, it was. It started out with a really simple concept of wanting to create a, a, a space that you can access anytime, anywhere that was geared entirely towards having helping you when you're having a, a tough time. Um, you know, so much of product design, UX, UI is all really centered, centered around understanding user behaviors and then designing an experience around understanding that for an end goal. And of course, for the clients, the end goal is always something that you know, benefits them in some way, which is, which is, you know, great. That's, that's kind of how the world works. Um, but what was missing that was out there was something that was benefiting the end user first and foremost, when it comes to their mental health. So for us, it was very much about trying to design that, that almost safe space um, without it, you know, sounding a bit a bit limp. Um, we wanted to make it so that you had knowledge and information and science available to you um, whenever you wanted. That was one of the things that we were recognizing was great about the internet, about remote working, was that you had access to so many things just because the internet exists. You had you could Google anything under the sun. You could kind of reach out and talk to almost anybody that, that you wanted to. And we wanted to create something that gave that same sort of access, but within an app itself. And I know a lot of people go out and do different, um, get involved in, in different sort of initiatives. But for me, you know, I spend more than a decade designing products. Um, and that was the skill set that I knew the best. And for me as well, that was the, the thing that was going to scale, creating a solution that you could offer to somebody who lives in rural New Zealand or somebody who's living in New York or somebody who's living in India. And it was that scale that, uh, of that accessible information that, I was really after it was applying good design principles a good user experience to something that was going to benefit people while finding ways to help educate them about general mental health and i felt like i brought this um very personal perspective of having known what it's like to struggle so much that i could apply into designing so when we started designing and building this just one one thing kept nagging at me whenever I looked at other um, mental health apps that were out there, branding, etc. What I found was that it was always very light colored, very pastel, a lot of smiling faces, peaceful poses, meditation. And when you look at it from a rational point of view, you're like, yeah, well, of course, you know, it's a mental health thing. You want it to sort of feel good. But the issue is that when people struggle with their mental health, a lot of times it's at night. The last thing you want is this bright phone just sort of glaring down at you. If you want to be discreet and anonymous, you also don't want it to attract attention. But the biggest thing really was that when you're struggling and feeling really, really crappy, seeing smiling, peaceful faces, that is the furthest thing away from what you feel and that contrast actually makes you feel even more isolated and even more alone so for us when we were trying to figure out figure out the experience and the branding it was very focused on making you feel cozy and safe 
you know, these dark, warm colors, these comforting illustrations, rather than trying to force this sort of happy peacefulness on you when it's the furthest thing uh, away from from what you could feel. So it was, for me, applying all this sort of product knowledge, this UX knowledge into an experience that people will find value out of. It's just kind of what I know how to do best. Wow. And there you are building this out and you get leukemia, right? <laughs> so so that's like a feels like a truck kinda of hit you, right? Yep. So so what happened? How did you find out? What was happening? Yeah. Uh, it was a crazy journey. Um, I started feeling really, really fatigued and then I quickly got sick. And um, this happened when I was in New Zealand. So my husband's Kiwi and, and that's why we were there. Um, so this is this was before we got married. Um, I just had this, this throat infection that I, I couldn't shake even with antibiotics, which was quite unusual. And it got to a point where it was bad enough that um, I had to go to a and e in in the middle of the night because it was it was so bad that i actually felt like i couldn't breathe and i couldn't swallow um and when i was there they gave me some medication they uh kind of just did a check on me to see if i was doing okay and they ended up taking some blood and when they were taking some blood they decided to just like run it through the labs a lab tech was the one who ended up saying like, hey, there's something wrong here. Um, it had advanced to a point where you could see just from my blood that things were really bad and it was really advanced. So the leukemia that I got was actually quite an aggressive uh, leukemia. And it meant that within that day, I was already in ICU. Um, you know, they, they were... Uh, doing something called leukapheresis, which is kind of like dialysis, but for, for your, your, your white blood cells, which is, um, which is the, again, the sort of leukemia that I had. Went into chemo straight away. I actually ended up having a um, blood transfusion, a plasma transfusion that gave me an anaphylactic shock. And off that anaphylactic shock, I actually came really close to, to dying. It was the full Hollywood crash cart, call the code uh, type scenario. And it was um, intense because what was happening was that my, my blood was actually coagulating inside me a little bit like a snake venom bite. Incredibly painful. Would not recommend going through that experience. Um, it, was, it was really, really scary. And even though I had almost died in that day, the, the leukemia was so aggressive that they had to start the chemo that very evening so it was a really 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 rough uh, couple of days um uh there and then from there it was just going through the the chemo which was very hard hitting um you know during which uh, uh i mean it was, it was not fun a lot of the very standard sort of chemo side effects um we ended up moving to singapore just because i wasn't a new zealand resident meaning the bills that were there, we paid all of it. Um, it was about 70 grand, seven zero, seventy thousand um, dollars The The only sort of bright side out of all of that was uh, two days after being discharged from the first round of chemo, which took a month, um, my husband and I got married in his childhood home, the backyard of his childhood home. And then literally the next morning, we had to fly to Singapore to, to continue the, the treatment. It was a couple more rounds of chemo, and then I had to do a stem cell transplant, which was uh, incredibly brutal. Um, but what made it worse was that it was around the time that the pandemic broke out. And I had found a stem cell donor that was a full match for me. But then the pandemic broke out and it turned out that he was located in Wuhan, China. So that didn't happen. I lost that, that donor. I, I don't really know what happened um, to him, but everything shut down. And it looked like I wasn't going to have a donor. And at some point we found another donor in Canada. And then when we found him, Canada started shutting down as well because COVID started hitting Canada and we thought like, that's it. Um, but this, this guy, like whoever he is, he pulled through 
like he came in, he did all the tests, he spent a week doing the tests, a couple of days in a hospital and got the bone marrow um, donation shipped across to me. And then I, I got that and uh, it was a very long one month in, in the hospital. Um, and then it, it actually took me about a year uh, to recover enough to be able to walk on my own. So it was very steep recovery, um, just trying to get better from that. But it was a, well, clearly very uh, insane journey, just getting to this point. Wow. Uh, that's rough, right? Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> super rough. I mean, pandemic plus this and that. <laughs> oh. I mean, and, you know, you're doing all of this and the crazy thing is you still keep going with the startup, right? So why? I mean, I mean, everybody must have been telling you, like, go take a break, uh, you know, you know, enjoy life. Um, why keep going with building this mental health startup? Yeah, it was just something I couldn't, I couldn't shake. I felt like, look, if this is the last thing that I do, you know, if I'm not going to make it out of this, then this is the, this is the way that I want to go. This is the the impact that I want to make. And I, I was fully aware that able to, in, in, in a short period of time, um, make something that was going to be that huge level of impact that, that I would hope to try and achieve. But what I could do was to start, you know, to, to sort of put the seeds in there and then have other people um, continue doing that but I think uh, another big part of it as well is that when you are sick to that level your life is just not really in your hands anymore you know you you lose anything that's familiar about your life you lose all forms of autonomy I mean it's down to the meals that you could have it was down to the waking hours that you were allowed to have um, everyone else was running your life to try and keep you alive and you didn't really have much of a say in that it was a combination of these things that made me feel kind of really helpless. And it was a struggle to go from feeling like, hey, I could do anything. You know, if I wanted to build a remote business, I could. If I wanted to start a mental health company, I could. And then now suddenly here, I'm not even allowed to, you know, have the meal that I want to have. Um, and this was in a weird way, uh, taking that power back into my own hands to be like, look, if this, this is going to be the last phase of my life, then this is the last thing that I want to do. I want to be able to leave this world saying that this, this mission that I set out to do, I might not have finished it, but at least I started it. How did you do both, right? Because, <laughs> you know, I mean, everyone else is like, oh, I'm working a job and I have to do this startup. It's impossible. Or like, you know, uh, I have kids and, you know, it's tough, which is, I mean, no joke. It is tough. And I'm doing this, but you're like not a level, right? You're in hospital <laughs> battling leukemia and building a startup at the same time. So uh, what did you do? How are you approaching it? Yeah, um, obviously during the times where I was very sick, um, you know, I wasn't working on it at all. That There was not a whole lot that, that I could do. Um, but in between where there were periods of time where I felt kind of well enough um, or when I was waiting to actually go into the hospital, then I would be working on it. And it was very much just a applying all the things I learned from building up a design agency into trying to set up things that could go to distance so it would be things instead of uh doing things like answering emails or trying to i don't know reach out to people and 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 find ways to like partner and things like that i'd be doing things like setting the mission setting the values um looking at the sort of organization that we want to build looking at what are the core um value proposition of what we're trying to do like what what are we focused on and what are we not 
focused on and how does that set us apart so it was just laying almost like the the um roadmap for how this company was going to be built rather than doing sort of like all the the building and it, it started out um very much with just trying to build an MVP and honestly I look back and I'm like yeah it's definitely not not my best work uh, but at the same time I think you know I have a pretty valid excuse um, but it was planting of, of that seed of what that product could be and I wanted it to be enough so that um, in case it was you know in the hands of somebody else they're understanding where it started from and then what is the potential of where it could go so I really channeled into focusing on those important bits but there were obviously like huge swaths of time where I couldn't work at all um, where you know it just had to be left on hiatus it, it was just I, I was too focused on well being sick and then trying to recover from there um, but my my husband and co-founder Rackley he did keep it going and I think in, in a way that was also his way of coping it's just like funneling it into something that feels like it will make a positive impact amidst all the stuff that was going on. Um, I, I obviously couldn't really do too many sort of calls and meetings like that. It was nowhere near the, the typical level of intensity that you have with doing a startup, but it was a lot of sort of internal laying the groundwork um, kind of work. But of course, anytime I was too sick, I just wouldn't wouldn't touch it at all. It was sort of at my own pace. And then as I started to get better, then I could pick it up again. Um, but yeah, it, it, I wasn't like full throttle trying to build something, um, you know, super functional, uh, going to, to go scale at, at that point in time. But it, it did give me time to reflect upon what we were trying to do and to understand, I think, the, the end user and the product and how it fit it all tied together a lot more. What's interesting is that, you know, in depression, you know, the end state of depression is your mind wants to kill yourself, right? Mm -hmm. And in leukemia, your body was trying to kill yourself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> so that's kind of, so I'm just wondering, did you, was there any like crossover or transferability of skills or resilience that happened? Or did they come, did feelings come back? Was the color different? You know, how did that seem? I love that you asked this question. Like, first of all, I love that you you could even sort of really recognize that um, because that's not, that's something that I recognize, but it's not, how do I put it? It's not a, a very easy way to sort of um, arrive at that, that sort of juxtaposition between, between the two. Um, and I'm so glad you asked that because death is such a scary topic. Uh, mortality people are just like oh no I don't want to touch that especially somebody who's come so close to it so I don't actually get that much of an opportunity to talk about it and it's hard to not talk about it because it was such a huge just this sort of shadow um, over my life for, for, for those couple of years um, it is definitely something that in a very weird way gave me a bit of an advantage so in all my mental health struggles death was something that I grappled with a lot and it is a process of accepting that death is inevitable you know it's in a weird way you kind of go through the the steps of, of grieving and acceptance that death is inevitable and when you are doing that I've I had a set say I had a, a, I was a few years ahead I think in spending so much time sort of contemplating what that meant the impact of that and then finally understanding that it's it's universal and even though I'm an individual experiencing my own life everybody's life ends at some point but that's that's not the worst thing in the world because your life ends at some point and that gives it in a way meaning to the fact that it's finite not infinite and you can keep doing kind of whatever you want um it gave me also i think an appreciation for living life on my own terms a lot because at the end of the day it's 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 gonna come to a stop you know at the end of the day all the things i'm worried about anxious about that still i struggle with they're not gonna matter at at some point and it was having that more developed relationship 
with the possibility of dying in my own mortality that allowed me to approach facing this, which is still incredibly scary. I can't, I can't sort of, you know, emphasize that enough. It's still incredibly scary, but I felt like there was a level of acceptance that like, Hey, if it doesn't happen now, great, but at some point it's still going to happen. And if it's still going to happen, what is that, that, sort of relationship that I want to have um, with with facing death and a a weird thing sort of happened um, when I had that anaphylactic shock you know that that near death experience that sometimes people talk about for some people it's a white light for others I don't know what else that they they see Um, and I had this kind of weird out-of-body experience with that where the hospital room that I was in um, and this was this was like literally right after this this happened there was sort of this figure of death that was in this room with me and and I'm not uh, honestly not really a spiritual um, or religious sort of a person so this was very unexpected but the interesting thing was that it wasn't a scary experience it wasn't like oh no like you know I might potentially die like I don't want to go this is terrifying if anything, it was very patient, it was very merciful, and it was up to me. And that those were the main feelings that I got. It was that, you know, death was here to take you away, just to to stop that suffering. Um, or almost like when when you're kind of ready to go. At least that was that was my experience at that point in time. But I would say in a very weird way, it was definitely an advantage. And the weird thing I think as well is when when it's it's right there, it's present, and you don't um, have, you don't feel like you know you have the, the the say in that. You feel like almost it's being held over your head, um, and you might not have a choice. Then it makes you kind of want to fight back against it more. It makes you want to be like, nah, it's, it, that's not that's not going to happen. You know, I'm going to keep trying to to push back against that. Um, so it was a very convoluted a lot of thinking a lot of kind of figuring out um but in a weird way that was that was a a very weird advantage that i think i kind of had and uh through it all how does that weird advantage translate to today right because now you're better um Mm -hmm. and obviously you still have to go through the dynamics of being, you know, immunocompromised in the midst of a pandemic still as well. So it's just, you know, you're still not out of the woods, woods yet. Uh, That being said, you know, now that you have the energy, the focus, the time, and you're building this startup, right? And you've gone through these two sets of experiences, right? One that makes you empathize with depression and mental health. But the other one is that, you know, close brush with, you know, mortality, right? And death. Mm -hmm. How does that translate to how you work today versus how you used to work before? Mm, that's a great question. I would say the biggest thing is is um, caring a lot less what people think. I mean, like back when my recovery was much more active and I was still sick a lot of the times, you know, if, if ever, uh, you know, somebody maybe saying that they were doubtful or they were like oh we're not really sure that this is gonna work or anything that was was negative um which which to be fair was was not very often it would always trigger this this sort of thought in me and this feeling of like well so what you don't think so like i think i get to decide after going through all of this like what what i think is now you know there is more weight to it. And I wish that obviously I have had the healthy perspective where I valued my own opinion more than the the opinions of other people. But I think in a way, having this experience makes it so that I care a lot less. Uh, It hurts a lot less because I've experienced something that hurts a lot more. Um, And also, you know, I've always, (laughs) my parents don't like this, but I've always been quite stubborn. but I think going through this makes me even more stubborn because it was like, well, you know, so what if somebody says no? 
So what if somebody hurts my feelings? Yeah, I've been through worse. I think I'm going to be totally, totally fine now. Um, and that that was one of the really big ones. I think the other really huge one was that I was very independent, um, you know, when I kind of started my first, first company, becoming a, a young adult. Um, and I think there was a component of kind of wanting to prove myself and prove my worth. And it felt like, okay, I had to do everything on my own so that it's valid, right? And going through being sick, realizing that, no, you can't actually do this on your own. There's a lot of things in life that you can't do on your own, but also you shouldn't do on your own. Um, and that, like, you can lean on people. They will come and support you. Um, and it's, it's, it's a relief. It's healthy to, to have that allowed me as well to basically bring that into my everyday life now um, personally but then also professionally I think it's given me the the even more of an ability to be more vulnerable to take um, you know maybe risks that I might have been a bit more uncomfortable with but also to really lean on the the, the people that I have around me both personally but also professionally in terms of work it is that extending of of that trust um and saying like look i i'm i don't want to build this by myself i want to build this with people who are also great and in order for them to truly be great there has to be that level of of, of trust and extending of that that trust to them and i feel like experiencing what it's like to be to be needing so much support and being sick, doctors, nurses, caretakers, friends, family. Um, I was all the more better for it. And now I can bring that into my work life as well. Wow, amazing. Uh, to wrap things up, I'll, could you share about a time when you personally were brave? <laughs> Ooh, that is a that is a great, great question. Um, you know, I, I found it quite um, fitting that, you know, the, the podcast is called Brave and then, and then we're called Bravely. Uh, it was just this like, oh, wow, that, that really fits quite well. Um, I would say that probably the biggest time that I was brave is most people would probably think like, well, when I was facing cancer, I, I was brave, but I found it to actually not be true. I was scared a lot. I wasn't actually brave a lot of the times. Um, and, you know, just as a, as a bit of a side note, there is a bit of expectation that um, people who face cancer or other serious illnesses need to be brave. And that's that's such a burden on top of them. So I won't won't sort of go with the answer where it's, it's talking about um, being diagnosed. I would say for me, the bravest moments that I had was all the moments where, you know, I had an opportunity to um, essentially quit life, if, if you kind of know what I meant. But I decided like, no, I'm, I'm not going to. I'm going to stay. I'm going to face what I have to face. And, and trust me, I did not want to. It doesn't feel like the Hollywood definition of brave where I'm not scared. It was very much that I was so scared. I didn't want to do it anymore, but I just had to because I had other things to, to live for. So it wasn't one specific moment, but it was a series of moments that frankly all felt like that same one moment where you sort of just sit there and contemplate like what it is that you want to do at the end of the day um, and for a lot of people I would say as well you know when they're facing that sort of situation it is brave to to keep going even though you don't want to it, it is because what you're facing it's 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 beyond tough um, so for me it's it's that series of moments that all kind of felt like that same one moment that I'm living through over and over again. I hope that sort of works. It's not quite a one moment as a few of them. <laughs> yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, I think that choosing to outlast and survive is to choose life, right? And yeah. to be honest, that's not an easy decision uh, to make consciously. Yeah. 
Well, on that note, I'd love to uh, summarize, I think, the three big themes uh, that I heard from this discussion. Uh, so the first is really thank you so much for sharing about your journey with depression um, from the inside versus the external journey of being success and being a founder and having your own agency and being able to work remotely. So I think that was really interesting where you brought us into both uh, what you call the power of vulnerability in helping you open up and getting help. And also you talked about the healing process that you know you had walked through and how that intersected with your own identity as a career professional uh, and as a perfectionist and as a workaholic and how to some extent your dig digital nomadism and all that stuff was a fruit of those things rather than uh, something that was just you know a luxury or enjoyment. Yeah. Uh, the second is thank you so much for talking about how you chose to channel uh, the energy in terms, of, and it was interesting to hear that the crusade, you know, or the fight uh, came before the healing to some extent. Yeah. Uh, and I think it was really interesting to hear how you chose to build a mental health app, but also some of the design choices that you've chosen to be contrarian uh, versus the market. And I think it was interesting to hear why you continued being a founder. Um, and I think the last thing is obviously, you know, your choice to outlast and survive leukemia and brutality, uh, but also to continue uh, drawing and interweaving the lessons that you had in the past uh, from your previous health struggles and your previous uh, entrepreneurial efforts and still choosing to fight for life and to continue to fight to build uh, the app and continue being a founder during the sickness even though you didn't know you were going to survive or not. And during your recovery, when you knew you were going to survive, but you could have done something else. And now that you're well, uh, still choosing to keep going on, which is uh, really tremendous and uh, I think quite inspiring. So thank you so much for sharing your journey, Melissa. Oh, thank you so much for having me and for all the incredibly insightful questions. Um, I really enjoyed having this this chat honestly um and i'm glad that you are giving me the opportunity to share my story and to be to be sharing that vulnerability as well thank you so much melissa all right thank you